Okay, thanks very much, Tim. <clears throat> so as Tim said, my name's Kit. I work at the University of Plymouth with Tim. And uh, I'm gonna take you through um, some of the existing science that we've been involved with as a research group over the last, uh, I think it's more than 13 years now we've been doing this research. Um, not myself personally, but our colleagues at the university and we've sort of been feeding into that in the last couple of years. Um, but also the wider kind of science surrounding rip currents. And, uh, you know, first of all, I'd say that you guys really are the experts when it comes to managing safety on beaches. So we're not in any way going to try and uh, preach to you about, you know, how you should be managing safety on beaches. That's very much your area of expertise. Uh, what we want to try and do is give you an idea of some of the science behind rip currents and what they are, why they're there and what sort of tends to switch rip currents on and off. And hopefully that will kind of really complement the uh, knowledge you guys already have about the rips on your beaches in Cape Town. So the objectives of, of this part of the talk are, first of all, we're going to talk about what rips look like and ways to spot rip currents, um, because that might be really obvious to some of you. Uh, but others, you know, it might be more difficult. And actually, you know, they, they are very complex things, rip currents. So it's not always obvious how to spot one. Um, but hopefully we'll give you some, um, some methods to do that. We're going to talk about what controls the hazard uh, posed by rips. So when are they more dangerous and when are they less dangerous? We're going to talk about the controlling factors. And what I mean by that is, you know, what are the things that drive rip currents? You know, it's predominantly waves, tides and beach morphology. But we're going to go into a little bit of detail about what exactly I mean by that. Um, and then we're going to talk a bit about the kind of global rip current advice that's given and talk about briefly some escape strategies of how to actually get out of rip currents um, if you do get stuck in one um, at the end. And obviously that's the sort of stuff that you guys um, probably, um, you know, probably the sort of advice you give out to the public anyway already. So it'd be uh, interesting to kind of compare notes on that. All right, so let's jump into some, uh, some basics there. What is a rip current? Well, the scientific definition of a rip current is a strong seaward flowing jet of water that starts near the shore and it travels out through the surf zone and ends up um, out in deeper water. Some people call them rivers of the sea. Um, they are effectively a flow of water that can take water users from the shallows to beyond their depth. And obviously they're dangerous because they take people out of their depth, um, but they also exhaust people and cause a lot of panic and you know, cause uh, quite a few incidents as you'll see. So that in that picture would be the rip current in this example. Um, it's a nice simple definition, but actually what you know, you'll see in the next few slides is they are very variable. They look quite different depending on which beach you're on, uh, depending on what time you go to a certain beach. And they're caused by subtly different things as well at different beaches. So we'll go into some of that as well. So here's an example of a local beach. Uh, it's actually just a few miles uh, from where I'm sat right now. It's called Perrinporth in the UK. And um, what you can see in this picture are big open areas of sand. And this is, this is at low tide. We have very big tides in the UK. So at low tide, there's a lot of beach exposed. And you can see these big areas of sand. And then there, there's, then there are these darker areas in between where you've got this dark blue water. And on Perrinporth Beach, this is exactly what the rip currents look like. They're these dark areas of water, and they're in between each of the sandbars. And we call uh, we call these bits in between the sandbars the channels, uh, and that's where you tend to find the rip currents at this particular beach. So there's one example. Um, here's another example of a similar type of rip, but at a very different type of beach. Um, so again, you can see some wave breaking on either side here. And in the middle, you see a darker area where you've got less wave breaking. And that's a kind of a subtle indication that there's a, a rip current present at that particular beach. So both of those examples I've just shown you are what we would call channel rips. And they are, they're called channel rips because they exist where there is a channel in the beach face. And really all a rip is, is water that's piled up on the beach by the waves breaking on the shore. And that water's then trying to return back out to sea. And what it does is it finds the path of least resistance. It flows along the beach until it finds uh, a channel and it uses that channel to flow back out to sea. But <laughs> it's never simple. You do get different types of rips. Uh, this is what we would call uh, a flash rip. Um, oh, 
Uh, I'm sure some of you might have seen those before, so I've got some on there. Unmuted. Um, so flash rips are different to channel rips. They occur because of a slightly different uh, phenomenon. Essentially, you can think of these as giant eddies that happen off, uh, when waves break. Um, they're different to the other types of rips I showed you because these tend to last for only you know, seconds to minutes in time. Uh, and then they sort of dissipate and they might pop up at a different location further down the beach. Um, whereas the channel rips tend to be very fixed in their location. They always occur in the same spot over those channels, although the channels do move over time. So there's another example of a flash rip. You can see it's like a big gyre, so it's almost like an eddy that's come off the back of a breaking wave. And they have the potential to take people out of their depth, just like the channel rips, um, but they are, yeah, subtly different in how they actually occur. Uh, here's some more examples. And you can see these rips, obviously, by big jets of sand flowing out the back of the surf zone, um, which doesn't always occur, but sometimes that's a real giveaway uh, that you've got a rip pumping out some water. Okay, and here's, a, here's a, a totally different type of rip. This is what we would call a boundary rip or a headland rip. And these, are, these occur because of a structure or a headland that interrupts the surf zone. So in this case, it's a rock groin sticking out. And you know, again, it's caused by water piling up on the beach and finding its way back out to sea. Uh, and that water in this case is piled up against the rock groin and flows out along the rock groin and creates quite a strong jet of water out the back of the surf zone as you can see from the, the plume of sand. So what I've just showed you there, uh, sorry, there's one more picture of another uh, boundary rip. So this is in between two headlands. A um, little bit less obvious where, where it actually is, but again, it's caused by water being piled up against the headland and being pushed back out to sea uh, along, along the headland. So what I've just shown you is three of the main types of rips. Um, that was a channel rip, which was the first one, a flash rip, and a boundary rip. And we, well, colleagues of ours uh, described these different types of rips in a recent uh, scientific paper they published. Um, you know, don't get uh, worried about this diagram, it's quite complicated, but really the, the three columns that you see in that diagram um, uh, just explain those three types of rips, the flash rips, the channel rips, and the boundary rips. And really, the ones we're gonna focus on today are the channel rips. And the reason we're gonna talk about those in particular is they tend to be the most common type of rip current. Um, globally, they're sort of the most common. Um, they probably produce the most, the highest number of rip incidents on beaches out of all the types. They're also probably the most predictable type of rip. Flash rips are almost impossible to predict when they're going to occur. And uh, boundary rips are, you know, are, are challenging to predict as well. But channel rips are the best understood and the most predictable type of rip. Okay, so we'll just go over some of the mechanics again, um, which I kind of briefly explained in those images. So as you're all probably familiar, um, you get these sort of shallow sandy areas on beaches, which we call sandbars. Um, it's typically where the surfers will be. Um, the waves break over the sandbars because they are shallower. Um, so you tend to get these concentrated areas of wave breaking over the shallower areas caused by the sandbars. In between the sandbars, you tend to get a deeper area where, which we call the channel. So all that wave breaking on the sandbar basically piles water up on the beach and that water has to get back out to sea. You, you do tend to get little kind of gyres happening on the end of the sandbars, but the majority of the, of the flows are kind of onshore. They're, they're pushing water towards the beach over the sandbars. And that water then creates feeder currents, which are these kind of arrows going along the beach. Uh, and again, those feeder currents will just flow along the beach until they find an area where they can get back out to sea. And that's usually where the channels are. So that's when you get this uh, flow going out between the sandbars, which is what we would call the rip neck. Uh, this bit in the middle and then generally those flows will just sort of dissipate once they get out the back of the surf zone. Um, there's, there's no longer any kind of pressure on this on the water forcing it to go anywhere so once it gets beyond the surf zone it does tend to dissipate in different directions and fizzle out um, but the fastest flows will usually be in the channel or in the feeders um, going along towards the channel <clears throat> so here's some kind of real world examples of channel rips um, i'll just point out in this top diagram we've got two kind of subtly different examples going on here one is a channel rip that's open where the waves are perhaps slightly smaller 
And the other is an example of a channel rip where the waves are, are maybe a bit bigger and you get occasionally waves that break in the channel, um, but there's enough waves that don't break in the channel to allow water to flow back out to sea. And you'll see what I mean by that from these images as well. Um, if you look at these ones on the right here, they're sort of smaller wave conditions where you've got quite small waves breaking on the sandbars, um, which allows kind of a nice open channel to, to let the water flow back out to sea. And you sometimes see this, this kind of ruffled water where those currents are going out to sea. Um, on this example down the bottom left here, you can see some white water across the channel. So there has been a bigger wave that's broken in the channel. And that does sometimes kind of make it harder to spot where the rip is because you've, you've not got quite as clear a channel um, to, to make it easy to spot the rip. Uh, other beaches like these two examples in the middle. So you've got one here, I think in Australia and one at the bottom here, which is uh, Perrinporth again. Uh, those ones, the channels are really deep and quite obvious from the darker water in between. So they've all got kind of similar features, um, but they look subtly different depending on where you are. Um, so as I mentioned, channel rips are very common. They, um, I mean, rip currents in general are the most common cause of beach incidents anywhere in the world. So I'm sure you guys deal with a lot of rip incidents in Cape Town, um, I would imagine. Um, but globally, they cause something on the order of uh, between 60 and 80% of all beach rescues around the world. Uh, and that's fairly consistent from country to country as well. Um, the US uh, Life Saving Organization um, put rip currents as a, a higher cause of hazard than sharks, hurricanes, lightning, tornadoes, and floods. So uh, they're a major cause of, of incidents and you know, a major cause of fatalities around the world as well. In the UK context, uh, they're head and shoulders above any other type of incident that we've looked at. So we've um, looked at more than 10 years of um, RNLI lifeguard data in the UK. And you can see the different types of incidents on the right there that we've, we've looked at. And um, you know things like strong winds and tidal cutoff cause um, specific incidents at certain types of beaches, but more than any other type of incident, rip currents uh, are by far and away the, the biggest cause. All right, so we'll have a look back now at some of the science that's been done over the years, and I'll talk about the ways that we've kind of tried to better understand RIPs. So the traditional view that was started way back in the 1940s um, was kind of determined just by watching beaches. You know, the scientists would go and make observations visually and, uh, and, and determine what was happening uh, on the beach, even as far back as 1940. And Back then, um, they kind of determined that actually the hazard posed by rips was mostly down to the speed that the rip was flowing. Um, the traditional view is that they always flow offshore and therefore the faster it goes, the more dangerous it is because the quicker you'll be taken out of your depth off the beach. And so this kind of logical rip current escape strategy um, developed over many decades, which is to swim parallel to the beach um, and you should eventually get out of the rip current and get pushed back onto the beach by breaking waves. And you know, a lot of the time that is correct, but what the more recent science has found is that it doesn't always work. I'll talk more about that in a moment. Um, so here's a kind of diagram with that traditional view of how to escape a rip, swim out of the rip parallel to the beach and you get pushed back on shore by the waves. So more recent research um, has used a bunch of different methods to measure rips. So on the left here, we've got an example of what we call GPS drifters. These are these funny looking devices. Uh, they're basically a flotation unit at the bottom with a, a kind of antenna at the top. They have a high accuracy GPS unit strapped to them. And we, we chuck them in the surf zone and we see where they go, basically. And they drift around and they go out to sea and we, we pick them up and they throw them back in and get some more measurements. So that's one way that we've um, studied rips. In the middle, you can see uh, a computer simulation of rip currents. And we're kind of increasingly using computer simulations because we've actually found by comparing them to the GPS data that they are pretty good at reproducing rip current behavior. And what you're seeing in this, uh, this quite complicated kind of animation in the middle is a beach on the left and the sea on the right. And the little black dots represent a virtual GPS drifter. So that is a, essentially a bather if you want. And the, uh, the model then predicts where those betas end up going because of the rip currents on that beach. 
and that's uh, that's proved to be quite a useful way to study rips another way that we've looked at rips is through laboratory studies so on the right you can see a big lab with uh with some yellow dye put into the water uh, the bottom of the left side you can see some sort of wave measurement devices and we would run waves in that lab and see what the rip flows look like and measure them uh, using a lab basically so just to show you some of those GPS measurements I was talking about, um, this is again Perranporth Beach uh, that I mentioned earlier. We do a lot of our research there. Um, at the top here, you can see a snapshot of the wave breaking. And on the right, you can see a sort of time averaged uh, image. And that really nicely reveals where those rip channels are. So you can see the, the areas of white water stand out and those darker areas between where you get less wave breaking really stand out in those time averaged images. And so you see that big channel in the middle. Basically, we threw some drifters into there. And on the bottom here, you can see arrows which show where those drifters went. So in each of those plots, the beach is on the right hand side and the sea is on the left hand side. And don't worry too much about the blue and red lines, um, but the little black arrows show you what the drifters did. Now, some went along the beach under certain conditions. Others rotated around in circles and um, others, other sets of drifters all shot straight out the back through the surf zone um, out to sea. And so we kind of describe these different behaviors as alongshore flows, rotational flows and exits. And usually, um, you know, the, the exits are considered to be the most hazardous type because it, they're the ones that take people out of their depth um, and take them out of the back of the surf zone. So I'm going to play a quick video now to show you what those measurements um, actually look like in real time. So in this, this one, we've got the beach on the left and the sea is on the right. And uh, the drifters are the little black dots, obviously, and the blue lines show where they've been. And uh, you can see that some just sort of truck around the surf zone. They rotate around, they get pushed back onto the beach by the waves, and they might go back out through the rip channel, which is just about here. And then others shoot straight out the back and, and cause an exit. And, you know, the only difference between those drifters was that you know, they were released at a slightly different point in time, uh, maybe a few meters south or a few meters north of the other drifters. So the key thing to notice really is that they don't all do the same thing. They don't all flow out to sea. They don't all rotate around. And therefore, it gets quite complicated when you're trying to uh, give people advice on how to escape rips. It gets pretty complicated because they don't always behave in the same way. So here's another quick video to show you some rip current circulation. Now the dye that you can see in the surf zone there, the purple dye, that's released to really make the rip uh, more obvious for a, a sort of visual um, reference. And you can see in this case that the rip is really circulating around. So you've got slightly bigger waves breaking in this scenario, which means that the rip is not kind of open. The flow cannot, cannot easily get out the back of the surf zone. And instead of causing an exiting behavior, it just rotates around the surf zone. Okay, so based on this kind of new perception of rip flow behavior, you see that we have both rotation and exits happening. And therefore the hazard that rips pose is not just down to their, how fast they flow, but actually also the type of behavior that those rips have at a particular time, uh, which we call the circulation pattern. So um, if you assume that rips always circulate around, you get this escape strategy of staying afloat and doing nothing. And that actually got quite popular for a while. Um, people were advising when you get stuck in a rip, you just float and eventually you'll get returned back to the shore. Now the problem is, these are obviously quite different escape strategies and both of them work in certain situations, but neither of them works all the time. Um, also these two types of behavior kind of mask a lot of different behavior that can happen in between. So, you know, rips are quite complicated things and they don't just always go off to sea and they don't always just rotate around. So I'm gonna show you a couple of animations just to show you some more GPS drifter measurements we've taken, just to show you how complicated rips can really look in the real world uh, when, you, when you stick a drifter out there and see where they're going. So you'll see a big rip channel in the middle here. The beach is on the left and the sea is on the right. Each of these little fireworks in the middle is actually a GPS drifter. 
uh, that's bobbing around the surf zone. Some of them are flying straight out the back into deep water uh, and causing an exit, and others are actually circulating around uh, within the surf zone. But you see there's a lot of variability. Some go offshore, some come straight back to the beach. Now, obviously, rip channels aren't always the same shape. Uh, so here's a different example of a slightly different channel on the same beach. So in this case, we get a few more circulating flows. <clears throat> um, but every now and then you'll get some fireworks going out the back. So that will be an exit, an exiting rip and, you know, potentially taking bathers out beyond the surf zone out of their depth. And you also get rips that look more like this, where you've just got a kind of a hole in the sandbar. Um, but they can, they can act in a similar way. So when you put some drifters in, <clears throat> some of them return back to the beach and others fire straight out the back and cause an exiting rip behavior. Okay, so those are real observations of rips measured using those GPS drifters on a beach in Australia. Um, and as you can see, it's kind of complicated. Rips don't always do the same thing. Um, but the, the main two types of behavior, like I said, are the exits and the circulation. Now, we did a bit more work to try and determine what controls those different behaviors and when do you get exits and when do you get circulation happening. Um, now, these, this slide here shows you the difference between smaller wave conditions and big wave conditions. So on the top here, you've got um, an example of some waves breaking on a beach with nice wide open channels because the waves are quite small. And when you run that same situation in a computer model, you get a situation like this. And all of these black dots represent, um, you know, a bather, if you will, or a, or a drifter. Uh, you've got the beach at the bottom this time and the sea at the top. And you'll see that a lot of those bathers are ending up out the back of the surf zone, which is kind of represented by this red dashed line. So in this situation where you've got small-ish waves, let's say below average wave height, you get a lot of exits happening. And this number at the top here, E, that's kind of showing you that 77% of all those bathers that were thrown in ended up out the back, um, out of their depth. Now, when the waves get a bit bigger, which is the bottom panel here, you see that you know, the channel isn't always open. You get some wave that break across the channel. Um, but there is still the opportunity for some um, rips to exit out the back. And you get a situation like this on the right where you get a lot more circulation happening. Um, generally, the, the bathers are kept within the surf zone because the waves are bigger and they have more ability to push people back to the beach. And this number E at the top here shows you that only 13% of all the bathers ended up out the back of the surf zone in this case. So there's clearly a quite a strong control from the wave height on the type of behavior you get of, on, of the rip currents. Okay, so I'll just show you another video now to kind of demonstrate that uh, more clearly, hopefully. <clears throat> so again, waves breaking over the sandbars, pushing water on the beach, and then the water flowing back out to sea through the channels in the middle under small wave conditions. Every now and then you get a bigger set, as you'll all be familiar with, a bigger set of waves, and that will create a pulse that forces water out through the channels. You can sometimes see that choppy water, um, so that's kind of a giveaway. Um, but again, that's caused by that water pulsing out through the channel. And yeah, as I said, when those channels are wide open, that creates a, a quite a big opportunity for people to be taken out out of their depth beyond the surf zone. So in smaller than average waves, you tend to get more exits happening, more exiting rips. Now, when the waves are bigger, you get very strong currents. There's a lot of water moving around, as you know. Um, but actually, you sometimes get less rips exiting out the back of the surf zone. So you tend to get more circulation within the surf zone, but less exits going out the back of the surf zone. And so this is when you get these sort of rotational rip eddies happening, shown by these blue circles. Um, but they're still quite hazardous because there's a lot of water moving around. So it's, it's a strong opportunity for people to be taken off their feet 
uh, moved around in the surf zone and occasionally they'll end up out the back of the surf zone uh, way out of their depth. So that's kind of the difference really between small waves and uh, larger waves. So we took some of that understanding uh, about the controls of rip currents to do with waves. Um, we also combined that with <clears throat> some observations we made around about tide level. Now I mentioned already in the UK, we have these big tides. Um, to give you an idea of how big they are, um, on the coast of Cornwall, which is where I live, uh, the difference between low tide and high tide uh, vertically is about seven meters. So that's a huge vertical change in tide, and that translates to be a huge horizontal movement of the shore up and down the beach with every tide. Now, my understanding of tides in Cape Town is they're much, much smaller. Um, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there's something on the order of one or two meters vertically. Um, so it's a, it's a lot smaller. Um, but what we notice in the UK is that tide does have a strong influence on the rips as well. And because that shoreline is moving so much up and down the beach, uh, as the tide changes, it, it can actually completely switch the rips on or off. And the reason for that is that uh, the, the sandbars and the channels are all found at the low tide part of the beach. And so when the tide gets up to high tide, we tend to find that the, uh, the rips switch off completely. So I'll explain that a bit more here. Now, again, this is quite a complicated uh, kind of diagram, but really all you need to take from it is that we have these two sort of two controlling factors. We've got wave energy on the bottom and we've got the tide level on the side. And we use the tide level and the wave energy to basically predict for the RNLI when the rips are going to switch on and off. Um, and we identified all these different rip behaviors that happen at certain wave heights and certain tide levels. And that's what these diagrams represent. You don't need to get too worried about the details of all of that because I'm going to explain it uh, in a minute. But the first thing to point out is that when waves are smaller, you tend to get more people in the water because it looks safer, it looks easier to access. Um, people are maybe more comfortable, more confident when the waves are below average wave height in the UK. So that's the first thing. There's a, there's a higher exposure when the waves are a bit smaller and a lower exposure when the waves get really big. Now, the second factor is that when you've got low wave energy, so all of this stuff on the left hand side, it tends to be low risk because there's very little energy in the surf zone. There's very little um, movement of water. So the rips tend to be quite weak. In this middle area where you've got average wave height, sort of average wave energy, you get a real mixture of, um, of rip risk in the UK. So you get a fairly low risk when the tide is high, right down to a very, very high risk when the tide is low. So because all of our sandbars and rip channels are at low tide, when the tide gets down to low tide, the waves break over the sandbars and they start pumping rips out of the channels. So under low tide levels with average wave conditions, we get our most hazardous rip conditions. When the wave energy gets high, well, we forecast a high risk because there's lots of water moving around and there's quite big, powerful waves breaking on the beach. Um, but actually, a lot of those rips tend to be confined to the surf zone. So people won't necessarily be, be able to get out the back um, from a channel rip, but um, the currents are still strong. So we, we predict a high risk still under big waves. So that's kind of a simple summary of the rip forecast that we generated for the RNLI. This is what it looks like. We pump out these PDFs every day. Uh, well, actually the Met Office in the UK pump this out. Uh, that's our weather service. And they basically rank the rip current hazard from one to five, similar to those, uh, those boxes I just showed you. And at different times of the day, uh, down the bottom here, you'll see that you get you know, slightly higher rip risk or slightly lower rip risk. Uh, and that, that sort of fluctuates depending on the tide and the wave conditions on a given day. So I've given you a bit of information about the complexity of rips and how variable they can be in reality. Um, but hopefully I've also given you the impression that, you know, there's really some fairly simple controlling factors. So in the UK, it's all to do with the tide coming in and out and the waves creating the energy to drive the rips. And that makes them quite predictable. Um, if there's any kind of um, doubt in your mind about how to spot a rip, um, you know, the main, the main advice is basically that they're visible at dark areas in between areas of, white, of wave breaking. So just look for those darker areas where there's less waves breaking, that tends to be where the rips are. 
The problem with that is that for beach goers, that often looks like the safest place to swim. So as you're probably aware, people quite often will just jump straight into the rip thinking it's the safest place to swim. Now there's a useful link here. If, um, you know, if you want to pass it on to any of your colleagues or any, um, I don't know, members of the public who want to know more about rips, um, this is a, a link to um, a guy called Dr. Rip, who's an Australian rip scientist. He does some good videos on how to spot rips and things. So that, there's a useful link if anyone needs to uh, pass any more information on to anyone else. So just to conclude on that, um, the key thing to spot a rip is that they're visible as dark areas between areas of wave breaking. There's three main types that occur. There's those channel rips, which I've talked most about just now, but you also get boundary rips that happen against headlands and groins, and you get flash rips, which happen momentarily. Um, they can be quite strong and powerful, but they tend to disappear after a matter of uh, minutes. So in terms of those channel rips, the, the flow speed and the circulation, and therefore the hazard, tend to all be controlled by wave height, tide level, and the shape of the sandbar on a particular beach. And if you can understand or predict the wave height and the tide um, and the sandbar, then you can basically predict what the rips will do. Now, the thing I haven't talked about is that the sandbar configuration is extremely difficult to predict. Um, as, you, as you will all be aware, sand shifts around on beaches a lot, the sandbars change shape, and the channels move up and down the beach. So this is really the aspect that's kind of at the cutting edge of where the science is at, at the moment. Um, but um, we've more or less got rip, rip prediction down just using wave height and tide level alone. And because of the, the different complexity that I sort of mentioned earlier, really a single escape strategy to give to the public is not appropriate because it doesn't always work. So whether you tell them to swim parallel or stay afloat, it doesn't always work. So there's not really one kind of message you can give to the public that will always work. And therefore, the best strategy is to always try and get them to avoid the rips in the first place. But to avoid a rip, you have to know what they look like. 